Entrepreneurs Over 40, episode 21 with Rob Kosman talking about how he makes money on Amazon with online arbitrage, as well as living as an expat in beautiful Costa Rica. Pura Vida. I, I, I don't care if you want to move to Costa Rica, if you want to start, you know, you want to travel in an RV, whatever. We always say, if you want to design a lifestyle that you want, figure out what that side hustle is and let it grow. You're listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40, the show for somewhat mature entrepreneurs and side hustlers. And now your host, Greg Mills. Our guest today has been selling online in various ways since 1998, when he made his very first website and launched a company selling online craft products. Today, his family of four have been living in Costa Rica since 2017, and they're loving it. In 2012, he and his wife decided that they didn't want an employer to have control over their income anymore. They didn't want to work long hours for someone else, and they were tired of making excuses why commuting two hours every day is not that bad when actually it is. They found themselves exhausted from working harder and not better. He decided to take action by starting to sell on Amazon again, creating an e-commerce company selling home products to large retailers, including Home Depot, opening an accounting firm, and writing children's books in four different languages. Without further ado, Rob Kosman. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me on today. That was was an amazing intro. Well, thank you. Now, can you take a few moments and fill in the gaps from that intro and bring us up to speed with what's going on in your world today? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, trying to keep track of the dates, I mean, you you got me pretty good there. I first started back in 99. I I created my own e-commerce website. Um, You know, at the time, everybody was all big on dot-coms. I'm like, okay, I need to do something big on dot-com. What can I sell? I, I don't know. So then I, I was trying out different things and trying to brainstorm. And funny enough, my, my dad at the time was manufacturing these craft products. They, they called them like for toll painting. So predominantly women would buy them and they're made out of pine. And maybe it's, you know, like a little sign and would they toll paint it nicely and nice pastel colors like, oh, home is where the heart is and things like that. So he kind of said, hey, do you, I'll sell you some of these. I'm like, okay, cool. So now I got to figure out how to build a website and how to get credit cards. This is before PayPal and everything like that. So I I contacted my local um, telecommunications company, which was like MBTEL at the time. They built me a shopping cart feature. It was super clunky, super terrible. We used like Visa, Monero's credit card processing, but it kind of worked. And I built a website and the way I did it was I went to Amazon's page and I went right click, save as, and I saved their page. And then I started to try to learn how to code it and kind of put it in HTML and make it look not terrible. And so I launched it and no one came and no one bought. So then I started to go into these forums where people hang out and these ladies with predominantly ladies would talk about tool painting and, and running classes. And I started to get in there and, you know, say what I had. And then I realized I was onto something because Instead of somebody, you know, who's a hobbyist buying one or two of an item, you know, two or three different things, I could sell to the teachers who were like, they buy 10 or 20 for their class and they keep coming back and keep coming back because they keep running more classes. So I I was on to something there. So that was kind of my first real taste of, of entrepreneurship. So I did that for a few years and then I ended up graduating university. I went and got my CPA, my accounting designation, worked for KPMG in Halifax, like Nova Scotia, back in Canada. Mm-hmm. And then I had a bunch of student debt. So I needed to pay my student debts. And normally, like people in Nova Scotia would go to Bermuda. That's kind of the, the thing. You know, you go do a couple of years of Bermuda, it's tax free. And I was lucky. I'm like, okay, Bermuda is like subtropical. And then my dad mentioned to me, he's like, well, what about Cayman Islands? I hear that's pretty cool and sexy. I'm like, yes, that sounds sexy. So I, Looked it up, got on a call. Next thing I know, I'm like, okay, great. You can move to Cayman. You got a job there. So I moved to Cayman, worked there for three years, and just did kind of the corporate gig. You know, it was like university, except people had money. Like it was all young, single for the most part, moving down, you know, and you're just like, this is fun. You know, you work, I mean, you go hang out, play, boat, whatever. Scuba dive is a big thing. So I did that for a few years. Cayman is just either insurance or audits for hedge funds and things like that. I like businesses that do stuff. And part of why I got into accounting, 
at first was I needed more than just an undergrad degree. I needed something else. I get a CPA and they'll basically pay for my schooling. And I get to see a bunch of cool businesses along the way doing audits. So one thing led to another. A friend of mine from university, he was working for a startup. They were just launching in Canada. He was going to be the president. He's like, hey, do you want to move here? And I'm like, well, things are pretty good. But at the time, my wife's office was starting one in Toronto too. So we're like, Okay, maybe this is the move for us. So in 20, I think that was 2006, we moved to Toronto. You know, startup, really fun. It was a, a company called Amp Mobile. And this was before like iTunes and stuff. So you'd watch like UFC on your phone and download music and everything. It was awesome. You know, we'd have like parties, but it was, it was hectic and crazy. And you're working long hours because it's a startup, trying to get it going. And one thing led to another. Our US parent went bankrupt. And then I remember coming home one day and it was like, oh, there's a package for me at the condo. And I, I opened it up and it's like, oh, you need to be in court tomorrow because some creditors were taking actions. I'm like, well, better call a lawyer. I called the lawyer and that night we put the company into receivership and I was kind of out of a job. So bounced around a bit. I, I did some consulting, got a job at Mars, which is a consumer packaged goods like m and Snickers. I think it's Milky Way, stuff like that. And I worked there for a while, still trying to climb the corporate ladder. And I was just kind of frustrated, not really for me. I just wanted to move faster. And then in 2012, we had our first son, Jackson. And I had an opportunity to take a, a CFO role at a small little telco. And I was like, okay, that'll, that'll move me up. Got a new son. We're starting this commute. And I'm driving an hour each way, plus traffic. My wife was working downtown. She was now on maternity leave for a bit. Is this really what we want to do? And that's when you know we, we took some action. We kind of came up with a plan. So one thing was I started selling on Amazon. We started our own accounting practice because my wife's also a CPA. So the two of us said, okay, let, let's start our own accounting practice. And she actually wrote a children's book, which was based on our son. And so she self-published it and put it on Amazon, Kindle, print on demand. Mm-hmm. But basically she creates all the, the artwork. She's not an artist or anything. She just hires someone to do it. So she just wrote the, wrote the story and made sure it rhymes and things like that, put it up. And then somebody buys it, she gets a royalty. So there's no investment, just the investment in the original artwork and, you know, doing it, putting your time in. But then actually once it's live, then someone buys it, she gets a few bucks. So she was like, oh, interesting, great. So I'll take this one artwork, one story and have it translated into multiple languages. So, you know, kind of leverage, you've already done the work, so why not? And then she's put it on Amazon Germany and things like that. So we're like, okay, good. This is start of a passive income, you might call it, right? So then I was selling on Amazon. I launched another e-commerce business selling home products. I was just trying everything, right? Because we, we, we decided then when we had Jackson that we didn't want anybody to control us because I, I just started to see so often anybody can get fired any day. Like it, it's crazy. And then I remember one day at a meeting with the directors of this new company and they were we were doing some consulting and we were trying to go after a project. And all these guys wanted was to get paid for their time to help do a presentation when I'm like, well, I did all the presentation and I did all the work and you just came in and tried to take some glory for it. And then you want to get paid. And that's when I really started to realize, I'm like, no, no, everyone's out for number one and they'll fire me in a minute. If they have the opportunity, everybody's disposable, you know, and, and then we started to see that in our accounting practice too. When you start a business, you have no clients, but you need to make money. So we were doing $99 personal tax returns. Like I hired a company to go put them on the telephone poles. We made some posters. That's how we got our first clients was like, I saw your flyer on a telephone pole. You know, we did, we started going and, you know, we got a few and, you know, you just, you need to make some money. You want to get it going and proof of concept because, you know, if you don't get some clients, you kind of get down yourself. Is this really what we should be doing? So we started kind of building that up and at the same time, I started selling some stuff on Amazon. So then we just kind of slowly started to build both of them up, you know, the accounting business and then what I was doing on Amazon. So when I first started, I was just doing thrifting, just things like that. Like not so much the thrifting, but I'd watch a couple of YouTube videos. These guys were like, oh, I go get these board games, you know, and use board games and you sell them and I'm like cool and I get a couple and then I'm like well I gotta make sure all the pieces are here and I'm like going through them this is really painful so you know that wasn't working I was using Amazon FBA which is when you basically buy the item you package it up and you ship it into Amazon it sits in their warehouse until the customer sells it right that's why you get the prime label and people are browsing and they see Amazon Prime they know and trust Prime they'll pay more for it because they know it's in an Amazon warehouse and it's going to get shipped. If there's any problems, they're going to call Amazon 
and Amazon's going to refund them the money and take care of it, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I started doing the, the games. That was terrible. The one things I did have some success on, and you probably still can have success, is, you know, like uh, Rock Band and Guitar Hero, you mm-hmm. know, those uh, video games where they had the actual guitar and the drums. If you find those, because you used to find them, you know, like five bucks, I'd find a guitar, and I'd sell it for like 60 or 70. You know, obviously, wow. you got to test it, make sure it works, but... They're hard to find. They're not making them. And, you know, they always ended up in thrift stores because parents clean out the kids' junk and that's the, the biggest things to go, right? If I ever get back into doing, you know, Amazon, I'll have to check on that. Now, what was your first product that you developed with Amazon or oh, that you sold on so Amazon? When it, I kind of did the, the cart before the horse. Usually the evolution is people start with like thrifting. Mm-hmm. And then they'll do like retail arbitrage. Retail arbitrage is you go in a store and you look for items that you can sell. You know, you go into Walmart, you find stuff that's on sale, and then you flip it onto Amazon. Or online arbitrage, which is mainly what I do now, where you go to the websites, you do the same, flip it on Amazon. There's wholesale too. But then private label is a big thing where, you know, the whole, you go on YouTube and you see these people, they're like, okay, we're doing private label. You just go to Alibaba, you find this yoga mat, you find this whatever, and you put your brand on it and sell it. It sounds super easy. So when I started, I took it to another level. I'm like, I'm going to try supplements. So I made my own white labeled supplement. And I call it white label, private label. I found a manufacturer and it was super sketchy. You know, it's the green uh, Garcinia Cambogia green bean extract, green tea extract something, and uh, raspberry ketones. I think everybody was like, oh, Dr. Oz is saying how great they are. And I never saw an episode where he said it, but apparently he did. And I really had no idea how sketchy the industry was. But I found a manufacturer and they're like, yeah, sure, put your brand on this and away you go. So that was what I actually started with on selling on Amazon. Oh, that's frightening that the, that the barrier of entry for that is is not that high. Uh, Were you ever concerned no, I, about, you know, the what you know, what you might have been what might have been coming in the package or so you you have to get properly U.S. FDA um, manufacturers okay. and things like this. I wasn't buying these from China. I was getting these manufactured. There was obviously a lot of government restrictions. And you know I, I had from a proper place, and they were a large manufacturer for a bunch of private label. But, I mean, all they do okay. is, like, here's the bottle. Do you want to put your name on the bottle? Here's all the ingredients. Everybody's got the exact same thing. You put your name on it, and you're like, okay, sure. Okay, well, that makes me feel a little bit better. That's kind of like the private label grocery thing where they all buy from the same cola manufacturer and but they have their own brands yeah it, it, exactly i started to do that and i spun my wheels on it and it just wasn't really working the thing they don't tell you is you got to spend money on ads like it's your own product you got to spend ads so it's like great you bought a bottle for four dollars and you're going to sell it for 12 but then you got to spend two or three dollars on ads and now it's even higher and it's more mm-hmm. competitive so that's kind of the, the the dark secret that a lot of private label sellers don't fully know and then people don't really tell you is how much ad spend you're going to have to spend up front you've got that initial capital like i'm going to make my own product I, i'm going to say yoga mats you know i bring them in put my name on it boom it's five grand my initial order or ten grand but then i haven't sold any and then i get to spend money on ads maybe another five grand to try to sell them and you know that's the that's what i i didn't have the capital nor the i desire to do that so that's when i kind right. of evolved out of that okay now, uh, just dropping back a little bit, did, do you come from an entrepreneurial background? Was anyone in your family an entrepreneur? Sounds like your dad might have been. My parents had video stores when I was growing up. So my dad used to be in construction. And then when VHS and, and Beta kind of first started, he started one of the first video stores in our town. So we did that. So I grew up and my parents had video stores for a number of years. They, yes, they were called video back then. Mm. It, it was neat. It was fun. So I had a bit of that exposure and running a business. And then I was, I think I was like 13 when I first started working in the stores, just doing some of the, the back work and warehouse stuff kind of thing. I, I did that for a while. And then I transitioned. I was working on the front desk. So I was interacting with customers all the time. Yeah, I had that entrepreneurial taste, but I also worked since you know i was 13 i had a part-time job right okay yeah most of us did you know growing up i was kind of laughing too because i I imagine jackson is gonna have no idea what a video store was why didn't they just stream it (laughs) they have 
we watch mostly like Netflix and Disney Plus and stuff. And every once in a while we go somewhere and there's like regular TV with commercials. And they're like, what are commercials? What's going on? Yeah. Your TV is broke. I've had our grandson say that to us before because they're used to more streaming services than we have. So what prompted you to choose Costa Rica? I came down, I guess it was in... Man, what was it, like 2015, 2014? No, I, I think it was like 2012, actually. You know, I, I almost before Jackson, so probably like 2008, I'm going to say. I came down with a friend. Um, we rented a house just on a vacation, rented a house for like about a month. Him and his wife and, and me and, and my wife, we came down. I was like, whoa, this is, we really like it. We had traveled here once before um, when we lived in Cayman. Because that was kind of a thing to go for Easter weekend. You, they used to have direct flights from Cayman to Costa Rica. So we came a couple of times. I'm like, oh, I like it. And then, you know, we went down. We liked it. When Jackson was born, we started talking about how is this really what we want? We were living in Toronto. We had a townhouse that was three bedroom. You know, we did fine. It's a big city. And neither of us had lived there before. So we didn't have, you know, like when you go into Toronto, and this is what we missed about Cayman. When you go into Cayman, you show up and nobody has family. Everybody's, you know, new expat or just coming in and everybody's auditioning for friends. And it's easy to meet, to meet people. When we go to Toronto, everybody's lived here and they have their circle of friends. And, you know, like you don't want to take out a Craigslist and be like, hey, a new couple here showing up, you know, look, auditioning for friends. Anybody interested? You know, it, it's tough. So we were, okay, this is where we want to be. Where do we want to go? What's the plan? And we started talking and looking at different places. We considered going back to Cayman, but it was so expensive. We just kind of kept coming back to Costa Rica was good. And after we came the first time with my friends, we ended up, uh, my wife and I were going to get married. We we're going to do a destination wedding. We checked out a whole bunch of places. Costa Rica was too expensive. Checked out more, ended up coming back, found a better deal, got married here in Costa Rica. So that was, you know, the second subtle hint, maybe. So we were going through and evaluating all our criteria, what was important to us. As, as we started to progress, we had two boys at this point. We had Jackson and Chase. So education was going to be important. Healthcare was going to be important. Reliability of internet and obviously location and you know, warm weather. We went through a hurricane, a category five when we lived in Cayman. Decimated the island. It was kind of like you're scavenging for a few days after. I didn't really want to do that again. So, you know, that wasn't high on my list. But then we also went to somewhere where we could actually become residents too and be able to stay. Because in Cayman, everybody was on a work permit and to try to get permanent residency was very difficult. So, you know, once we started going down that, we started evaluating Panama, we started looking at Costa Rica, places like that. And then eventually Costa Rica just kind of kept coming up and coming up. So later on, my wife and I decided, okay, let's take it on kind of an adventure. Let's take a trip down, maybe we'll buy some land, you know, maybe we'll really scope it out, check out the school the kids would go to, you know, get a little committed to it, right? More than just, you know, the high, oh, we're talking about it someday, someday, someday. Mm-hmm. So funny enough, we came down, checked out the school, liked it, liked the area, the area where we originally came on vacation. It just made sense. There was a lot of schools around here, a lot of expats, you know, that community where, you know, people are just kind of coming in, but still a lot of, you know, Ticos that live around. And, you know, like, okay, that was a good blend. We didn't want to go rural, you know, like off the grid in the jungle, that kind of thing. That's, that's not my gig. You know, so we this just kind of worked for us. So now as I'm sitting here, I live in the same area, resort, complex, whatever you want to call it, that we actually got married at 10, 12 years ago. Sometimes you just kind of got to go with it, right? Like if it works and it feels good, it feels right, and you've been here and you're familiar, I'm like, okay, let's let's do it. You've kind of come full circle, so to speak. So you look like you're in great shape. How has Costa Rica benefited your lifestyle? I'm looking also at your Live Fit shirt. <laughs> well, it, it's risky, right? Because you, you feel like you're on vacation. Vacation cocktails can flow. So you got to be careful about that. But I'll, I'll tell you, like coming from Canada where it's it's cold and, you know, like trying to get out of bed. I mean, as an entrepreneur, you know, like you got to motivate yourself some days. Like, because it's an open book. It's awesome because you can do whatever, but you still got to make money and get things done and keep things moving. So I'll tell you, I say this to my wife often. It's a lot easier to get up when it's sunny. We get up here at 5.30. Now I go to bed at like 9, but every, the jungle all comes, you know, the, the monkeys start howling at 5.30, the birds start, everything's starting to go at 5.30 in the morning. 
but it's easier to get up because it's sunny, it's not raining, it's not snowy, it's not cold. You, know, you don't have to wear pants. It's just there's there's more oomph in your day, I feel. And you know, you get out and get going, go for a walk, you know, kind of start your day. And the food is it's fun. Whatever you want, you can get it. There's enough. You can get pretty much whatever you get from your home country. And you just got to pay for it. There's like the Gringo Grocery Store, which is really nice air conditioning and the prices are pricey. Or you can go to the local fruit markets down the road and get stuff that probably came off a tree literally like yesterday, right? Now, you're, you've been blessed in that you've lived in a number of very scenic, gorgeous places. Uh, my wife and I took a trip to Nova Scotia and just absolutely loved that area. Can you describe what the Pura Vida lifestyle is in Costa Rica? It's funny. Everybody says Pura Vida. You know, it's almost like a greeting or, hey, how are you? People are definitely relaxed. It depends on where you go. If you need to do something with the government or you got to go somewhere and get things done, then quite often it'll take you two or three times. People give you bad information. You show up somewhere, it's closed. So you got to just kind of roll with it and expect, okay, when we first came down, we were doing a lot of things to get our, our, our temporary residency and things. And you're always just like, well, you know, we're probably going to do this twice, right? You know, and just, oh, we might open today. Uh, today we didn't open, you know. The, the thing is that it's relaxed. You don't get too stressed about that. But at the same time, when you're trying to do things, sometimes it, it does get frustrating. People are like, oh, man, you know, Pure Vita. And sometimes it's a bit of a scapegoat. But, you know, like the thing is for us here, we've engineered where we, you know, like our school is just 20 minutes down the road. Everything's close. Like the beach is a 10 minute walk down here. The golf course is a five minute walk. We have a golf membership. I never could have afforded that back in, in Canada. Now we golf as a family, usually once, sometimes twice a week. You, you can't get as much stuff as you want to purchase. So you're not so wound up in that. Hey, I love Amazon. Don't get me wrong. Buy all kinds of stuff on it, but you know, like, you, you don't need all that here. I mean, I don't even own a pair of pants. The other day it was raining and you know, I said to my son, I'm like, oh, your rain jacket doesn't fit you. And he's like, it's been like a year and a half since I put on a jacket. <laughs> you know, like, it's, you know, like, it's fun. It's different. But it, it's what you want to make out of it. I still work quite a bit. Some people, they don't work. Maybe they have retirement savings or, you know, they work very little or they're on a sabbatical. So they're like, oh, I'm doing yoga class today and I'm learning Spanish in this hour. And, you know, like, it's kind of what you make it, you know, and everybody kind of has their own experience and and how they approach it. I think you mentioned that you bought property. So you are in Costa Rica, you are allowed as an expat to, to own property. Yeah. So we, when we first came down, we bought a, a plot of land in a gated community. We we're talking about building a house. Um, and yes, you can own it, you know, like you can own it in a corporation, you can own it directly, but yeah, there's, there's no problem with that. So right now that was when we first, so I guess that was five years ago, five or six years ago, we bought our, our, our piece of property there with the plan of moving down. I think the goal was 2022 was when we originally said we were going to be there. I think it was 2016. I remember. So at this time I had been packaged out of my corporate job and I was you know, working on my accounting practice, working on Amazon, we packaged out. My wife messaged me. She's like, I think I'm getting fired today. And I'm like, you're crazy. She goes, no, I just passed the HR girl on the elevator in the hallway. She always talks to me and, you know, they kind of bro out, you know, and chit chat, but she doesn't, she doesn't work in the same building. So she's like, mm, you're here, but you wouldn't really talk to me. And just kind of, she's like, hmm, that's weird. Two hours later, she messaged me. And she's like, come get me. Got fired, got packaged out. She's like, we're moving to Costa Rica. And I'm like, whoa, 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 you know, that's like, let's just, you know, let's, I was excited, but I'm also nervous. I'm like, okay, we've been talking about it. You know, yes, we bought the land, but you know, this is like 2016 and we kept saying 2022 maybe. And you know, like, it's really raw. Like, let's just talk and relax. And she's like, no, this is what we're doing. And you know, so that was in, she finished up in December. I think this was like November. She finished in December of 2016. And then we just kept doing the tax season. We said, okay, we'll finish out the tax season in, in Canada and then move. And, and that was what we did. Because we already had the land, but we didn't have a house. So then we ended up finding a house that was just a little bit down from the land, you know, in the same community to rent. And that way it would give us a bit of a feeling. Like, I'm still an accountant. I'm a little risk adverse, right? Like I, I bought the land, but I'm like, do we do enough research? You know, we're only down a few days. Is this exactly where the best place we want to live? What about further down? You know, we really haven't explored so many more areas, you know, within that like half an hour, there's 
there's Flamingo, there's Brasilito, there's Potrero, there's Tamarindo. So we were still cautious about building until, you know, we were down here and really kind of lived in the area a bit. I mean, you know, you spend like, I think we spent, I don't know, it was like $70,000, $80,000 a piece of land. I don't want to spend another couple hundred grand to build a house yet. Like, let's just, you know, kind of wait. And I'm glad we did because we didn't build it. We moved. Okay. So the prices, it sounds like for, for land and, you know, building a house like the type that you wanted sound very similar to the States, at least in the part of the country where I live. Yeah, for sure. And since COVID, the prices have just gone through the roof here. I think that once COVID hit, a lot of people were at home. They're like, okay, you know, what, what am I waiting for? Maybe we need that second property or maybe, you know, we spend half the time there. And with the move to working from home, so many more people had that flexibility. And I've, I've seen it here, like where I live, there's very little inventory for rentals and the prices just keep going up because usually what happens is, you know, there, there's like a group of families that'll come in and just say, okay, I'm going to do a year here. And they'll rent a place for a year and get a car and go to school and, you know, just try the adventure for a bit, but, you know, leave after a year. That's the down part, you know, it's kind of, it's a little transient sometimes. Um, but when COVID hit, they didn't have any of the people flying in. So it's almost like there was two years of built up people that wanted to come. And then I think COVID created a lot of people to, to reflect on what they were doing and, you know, life and, you know, is this really what we want? And, you know, we keep saying someday, maybe someday is now, let's do it. Or let's, you know, buy a place, rent it out most of the time. You know, we'll come down for a few you know months at a time. And, you know, so the prices have really gone up and the availability is, is definitely low. So I don't know how long this is going to last, but you know, right now it's a hot market. How how did your family prepare for the move? Did you have to sell everything, or did you kind of prioritize stuff or ship it over? Yeah. So again, sometimes things just start to to work. So we're in the middle of tax season; it was busy, but we lived in Toronto, so it was a super hot real estate market. And I keep an eye on what's going on. And we lived in a townhouse, and there was a row of them. And there was one for sale a few doors down and I was trying to see, you know, what it went for. And I heard, I was like, okay, interesting, cool. You know, like that's what it'll be. But I mean, we had two kids, uh, chase at the time was three, you know, we had nothing nice, you know, we had crappy couches, you know, like stuff when we first bought, we moved to Toronto, that's all we've had. And, you know, you buy a few things, but kids destroy stuff. And we were like, we're not buying anything nice. So we didn't, you know, a lot of our stuff we either threw out, we tried to sell some, we tried to give away some things, um, and then we put some into storage to, with, you know, the idea of shipping it down, you know, the better stuff. But, you know, I mean, our, our couch, we're just like, yep, straight to the garbage, you know, it was ripped up, it was, you know, like junk, right? I can't, in the good conscience, sell this to anybody, I can give it away for free, but it's not even worth that. Put it on the curb, someone takes it, your problem, not mine, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we, we, we did that, we put some into storage. Um, which was a bad idea, hindsight. But one day, all of a sudden, you know, we were working away, and a lady knocked at the door, and my wife opened it up, and it was a real estate agent. She was just cold calling. She says, yeah, I have clients. They just missed out on the bidding war, you know, four doors down. Are you interested in selling? Marcia yells up to me, you know, upstairs. I'm like, come on in. So that was on a Wednesday. She had her clients in Friday, and I said, look, you know, this is the place it's lived in. I'm not staging it. I'm not doing any of it, but you know, you want to make a deal. I already know what that one sold for. I know what your commissions go for. You know, I know what the market rate is. What do you want to do? So that was Wednesday. She brought her clients Friday, Friday night. We had a deal done. Wow. That was just incredibly easy. I'm assuming that you sold your cars as well, your vehicles, and you bought something there. Yeah, so we had we had two cars at the time, and again, weird coincidence, one of them was on a lease, and it was just finishing, you know, in May. So we're like, perfect, get rid of that one. And then the other one, I ended up giving it to my parents, so they had it shipped down to uh, New Brunswick. But okay. then the stuff that we had, the good stuff, we put it in a storage locker, 24-hour public storage, security, blah, 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 all these access codes. Terrible decision in hindsight. Three months later, my wife comes back to check and get some stuff, shows up. She's like, mm, this is not our lock on the unit. And opens it up. Sure enough, the TVs are gone, my Sonos system, our bikes, you know, pretty much anything of value is all knocked off. And so tell me that wasn't an inside job. You know, she went down to the counter and the guy was like, yeah, here's the pamphlet, call the number. 
if it was my business and all of a sudden someone's broken into, I'm like, we're pulling the tapes. We need to figure this out. We need to get to the, you know, the problem. And we finally ended up shipping it down. And the stuff we did end up shipping, it wasn't a full container or anything. It was only a half, you know, not even. And it was just some furniture pieces that were valuable or had sentimental value. But before we did it, we went back again and went through it because stuff that you think you needed. And then, you know, after a year, you're like, no, I don't need that. Bin that, get rid of it. You know, like it's a, a different mentality too. You know, like sometimes you just, you want to hold on to stuff and I'm bad at it. My wife rags at me for it, but like, you know, I may need that someday, you know, but just trying to let go of it. The less stuff you have, the less mental capacity it takes to think about it and worry about it. I'll switch gears a little bit here and I'm going to kind of throw both of these out. You mentioned online arbitrage as well as Amazon. Can you walk us through those? Sure. So I sell on Amazon and I, I use a method in the biz. We call it online arbitrage. So it's really just flipping, re, you know, okay. reselling. You're flipping stuff. So what I do is I'll go to a website like Walmart and I'll find a Lego set that's maybe on sale and I'll buy it. And then what I do, because I'm here, I have a ship. So I have a lady who works for me in Toronto. I'll have a ship to her or I have a couple prep centers. So there's businesses out there that will prepare your products for you. So I have, I use two of them in the States, another one in Canada, plus my helper. So I order the stuff. It arrives to, let's say, the prep center. They'll inspect it, make sure it's not damaged and everything. Then they'll create a shipment in my Amazon Seller Central, like my back end. And then they put it in a box and they ship it into Amazon for me. And it sits there until someone buys it. So someone goes on and they, they're looking for this Lego set. It's a Star Wars Lego set, let's say. And they look at it and they say, oh, it's you know $1.99 and it's Amazon Prime. And they add it to the box. Most people... You'll look and you'll see sometimes it's shipped by Amazon, sold by Amazon. Sometimes it's shipped by Amazon, sold by Rob Cosman. But a lot of people don't really notice that. And so that's what I do. There's kind of two main methods. Either I'm buying things at a discount and trying to sell them at kind of the normal price. Or I'm buying things usually at like normal price and selling at an inflated price. Either due to demand and supply. It's hard to find some stuff that's like particularly Lego sets that might be retired or harder to find um, shoes and boots and things like that. Okay. Now, do you use any type of special software or things to track deals, or how does that work? I, I use tons of it, but, you know, just starting out, it, it's, right. it's, it's really simple. So one thing is there's this one little software, and if anybody shops on Amazon, this is going to change your life. It's called Keepa, K-E-E-P-A, Keepa.com. So it's a Chrome plugin for your Chrome browser. And what it'll do, there's a free and a paid version. The paid version is like 15 euro a month. That's what I have because it shows me a sales rank. But what this does is it will show you the historical price of that item over time. And then you can set an alert. So if, for instance, you're looking to buy this PlayStation and it always sells for 300 bucks, but every once in a while it drops to 250, you can set an alert to say, hey, send me an email when it drops to $250 and it'll send you an email. So Keepa plugs into the data from Amazon through like their back end, and it's always pinging it. It's gathering historical pricing, and it's also gathering what they call a sales rank. So if you look at a listing, it'll tell you what a sales rank is, and it's a number, anywhere from like one to like millions. But depending on it, say if I look at a toy and it has a sales rank of 2,000, I know that's probably selling this time of the year. Maybe it's selling 50 units a day. So there's data available using like Keepa to help me make these decisions like, okay, this normally sells for this after the Amazon fees, you know, how much money am I going to make on it and how quickly would that probably sell? So that's one tool that I use. And another one is one called AZ Insight. And it's another Chrome plugin. When I look at the Amazon listing, it pulls up this little calculator and I put in my buy cost. So it pulls in what the current selling price is. I put in the buy cost and it shows me my profit margin, my ROI right there. It pulls in all kinds of data as to how off, you know, historical pricing, um, what's my break even, all those calculations right there. So literally I can look at a Lego set, look it up really quickly on Amazon and put in my buy cost and show me right there. Okay, is you know, will I make the threshold of how much I want to make? Great. And then the sales rank, well, how often will it sell? Okay, I'll buy three of them. I'll buy 10 of them. I'll buy 20 of them. I'll buy 100, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever gotten stuck with something 
you know, that you thought would just fly off the shelves, something that looked like it was a great deal, but had a horrendous sales rank and you, you know, might not have realized it. I'll tell you one story. And yes, you still make mistakes because I'm also taking risks, you know, like especially on going into Q4 and the amount of supply shortages everybody's talking about through everything coming from China and toys, you know, like I'll take a risk. I'll, like last year I bought one toy I was, and I'll probably buy it again because it's still hard to find. I bought hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of units and I was actually buying it from Amazon, selling it back on Amazon. Amazon was the only person that had them. So I would just buy them and sell them, you know, I'd buy them for 20 bucks and sell them for like 60. But what, a few years back, there was a, a shoe. It's an Adidas Superstar. It's a very classic shoe. It's a white one, but it was for women. And it was the white with the uh, black stripes. And for whatever reason, it was hard to find in the States. And I could find them in Canada. So I went into a couple of shoe chains and I said, okay, how many you got all across the country? And, you know, I bought like, I don't know, it was probably like 100, 150 of them, maybe even more across various sizes. So I brought them all in. I was selling them like crazy. It was great. Then all of a sudden Amazon says, we're restricting a couple sizes. It was like seven and seven and a half. I couldn't sell those sizes for whatever reason. And I found out, I looked at it, there was a bunch of people manufacturing, a bunch of knockoffs that were selling it. So people were complaining on those sizes. And it was only those ones that I guess they were knocking off. So suddenly I had, you know, 30 or 40 pairs of these shoes at 100 bucks each that I couldn't sell on Amazon where I get the most amount of money. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Eventually I waited it out after a couple months and they finally opened it back up and I was able to send them in. But, okay. you know, shoes are different than a hot toy. You know, sometimes I make a, a judgment on, you know, like I think I was doing, um, I forget what they called you, like a Furby type thing. You know, I thought it was going to be really hot and the supply would shrink. And I started buying a bunch early on in October. The supply never shrunk. So, you know, I, you, know, you get to a point where you're like, okay, fine. Just get your capital back, right? You know, maybe it didn't make any money. Maybe you take a $5 loss on each, but get that money back. And then you can reinvest it into something versus waiting another two or three months and hoping. You know, sometimes you just got to cut your loss and, and buy something else. Now, how much time would you estimate that you work on this per day or per week? Amazon, a couple hours a day. It really goes up and down. Depends on how much money I have, how much credit card room you have. Um, but most of it, like I've outsourced it. I mean, really what I just do is the buying. Mm -hmm. And I've outsourced all my prep. So the prep is all done. I have a, a repricer, which automatically adjusts my price depending on the competitors. And then I've got guys that handle customer damages because, you know, people return stuff, it gets damaged. So I have a system in place that, you know, the guys will, we call those open cases, get me reimbursed. Then I send it off to another guy. <clears throat> Excuse me. He sells them on eBay, Poshmark, wherever he can. Um, so I, I've got that. So basically all I'm looking at is some pricing and just the purchasing. You know, I could start to outsource some of it. It, it also depends. It, it's seasonal for me. So for Q4, you know, around Black Friday, things like that, I'll, I'll do more of it because I'm buying more and I'm spending more money. But stuff's turning over. Whereas in tax season... I'll spend less because I'm spending more time on the accounting. So, you know, I spend less time on Amazon. So it's kind of, you know, ebbs and flows. It's really if, you know, I, I can go some days, you know, I'll go two or three days and not buy anything. But if all of a sudden, you know, one of my favorite stores, you know, I've got like 10 of them, let's say. One of them's having a 25% off sale today. I'm like, well, let me go see what I can find. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, what category do you recommend somebody just starting out to focus on? When you first start out, you're going to be gated is what they call it. You're not going to be allowed to sell every type of brand or product. Some of them are, are going to be gated forever. Others require you to find a good wholesaler, a correct wholesaler to get ungated. Um, others will just open up over time. I mean, your brand new account, Amazon's not going to trust you to sell Nikes because they think you might send in fake Nikes. So when you first start out, probably home goods is what you're going to have, like coffee makers and things like that might be able to start with but really it's about just scanning so you download the amazon seller app on your phone it's for free i have a paid one called profit bandit but you can just use that and literally you just scan items you go up to them you look at the barcode you scan it mm -hmm. or you look up the barcode on on the website and see if you can sell it but you know you're going to be gated in toys for the first bit if you can get ungated there toys are good but i would start probably with home goods they're usually pretty decent you know, a lot of people recommend starting with books. 
um, around your house, just looking and see what books you have. But I mean, Amazon is a book company. That's what it started with, right? So use books. That would probably cost you no inventory. Just go and start scanning what's in your house and sell it. Reference manuals and some textbooks and things like that, cookbooks. You know, those are what people are looking for, specialty cookbooks. You know, it's the more obscure things. But I never did books. I didn't really have a lot of books. And books are too much. Like, for me, it's just too much time. Like, I was starting with the thrifting. You know, you scan a bunch of books. And, you know, I just wanted to be more efficient. So I just kind of jumped the books and went straight to arbitrage and buying brand new items and and flipping them. Okay. Now, are you selling any physical products that you are, are sourcing not via the online arbitrage like you had started with the the vitamin supplements are you doing any of that now no so i I do have another business with my father where we have our own e-commerce website and we make some home good products he manufactures those and we sell those on you know like multiple channels like home depot and house and places like that so but he makes it instead of me going and get a chinese manufacturer you know he's the one that manufactures it and you know we do like reclaimed wood products so he makes those and then ships them out. I handle all the back end. I handle the customer service calls. You know, we don't get that many, but you know, I get people that call and have some questions and you know, I'm okay to talk to and I can chat with them on the phone. And you know, it's, it's usually, you know, people like, oh, I'm, you know, confused about square footage and you know, can you help me through this calculation and, and stuff like that. So we still do that, but our, Amazon's not our main channel for that. You know, Home Depot and our own website are the main channel for those businesses. I don't do any of the kind of traditional private label stuff that people advertise. Now with uh, Home Depot, how do you get started with that? And do you do they do it like a fulfilled by, well, we'll say fulfilled by Amazon, but fulfilled by Home Depot? Or do you have no, to handle the shipping? Yeah, so we do the shipping. We do a drop shipping. So they pay for the shipping, I get the orders, and then we slap their labels on it. But it's a drop shipping. Yeah, so okay. then they don't carry the inventory. We're not available in store. It's only online. But how I got there, so that business kind of evolved. It's funny. We started with Etsy. You know, we were doing reclaimed products, reclaimed wood products. You know, I saw something on HGTV, and I said to my dad, can you make that? And it was like a reclaimed wood light thing. He's like, yeah, I can make that. So we started doing that, and then we are doing some iPad holders that are reclaimed wood. And we're getting some good traction on Etsy. Then we evolved to a website called House, H-O-U-Z-Z. Mm-hmm. And that's same type of thing, third-party marketplace. We list our products, we drop ship them, you know, they give us the shipping labels and we send them in. So we did that and then we became popular in a couple categories and then suddenly Home Depot came knocking. Category manager found me, you know, I think category manager might be the right term. And he's like, hey, yeah, you interested in selling Home Depot? I'm like, heck yeah, I am. But I'll tell you, it's an entirely different game onboarding with that kind of a company. Like literally six, eight months to set up SKUs and get going and just really slow. And, you know, like I'm not the smartest guy, but I can kind of understand some of the tech stuff and making SKUs and things, but there was just a whole nother level and it was really painful. But like most things, if it's painful and a higher barrier of entry, fewer people are going to do it. So it should be less competition. And it's probably worth it then. Exactly. So did they require you to have any uh, special insurance that you didn't. Know. You got to have uh, liability of two million, I think. General liability, product liability insurance. You got to have all that. They're big on. You've got to hit all your metrics. You know, if someone orders something, it's got to be shipped within two days. If you're late on the shipment, they send you a fine, hundred twenty-five bucks. I think it is. Ouch. You know, it's it, it's big. Like the other day, I got an email, and they're like, "Hey, we're doing a they call it a category refresh, and you've got to go in and update some of the items on your SKU because there's all these different details they need to know, and if you didn't do it within like two or three days, you could be subject to fines. So again, they just fine us and they just withhold it from what you're going to pay. So, you know, that's, that's a downfall. I mean, these guys have massive traffic, massive, massive customers, but you know, you're kind of at their whim. They're not your customers. They're Home Depot's, they're Amazon's, you know, like that's the thing. When they come to my website, they're my customers. Now that's, that's what you always want to try to do, but you know, having your own website, trying to get customers there isn't necessarily the easiest thing when you've got behemoths like that. The customers are all there, so right. You know, so have you have you figured out any way to, to transfer or say you sell something on on Home Depot.com to actually capture the customer's email or 
you know, was, you don't get that because if you do that, that's how you get kicked off, right? Same okay. with Amazon. If you're trying to go after because they're their customers and they're very protective. Like I've got their customer contact details, but I can't contact them because they're Home Depot's customers, they're Amazon's gotcha. customers. And that's okay. where people get into trouble, especially on Amazon. People trying to incentivize them for reviews and things like that. That's what gets in trouble. Home Depot is a little more relaxed because store reps will call me. And they're like, hey, I got Joe here. He's got some questions about your product. Or when can you get this in stock? When can we get that in stock? They're a little more flexible. It's funny. When you talk to the Home Depot customer service reps and people on their end, they're smart. They're good. They're people like you and me. You know, like they're people that, That's their career job. Whereas, you know, you talk to the Amazon reps, it's all about metrics. They're trying to get as many calls as they can. They just don't read things. They just reply with a standard template. They could be anywhere and based in the world. And if they don't answer 30 cases in an hour, they're fired kind of thing. So right. it's, it's frustrating, but dealing with the Home Depot people, way smarter, way better. I was originally going to suggest capturing warranty information and then contacting, but you the way you explained it, that makes perfect sense. They're not obviously not going to want you selling directly to their customer. And sometimes they are more flexible because they will call and say, hey, I've got this customer. We're out of stock. I'll just send them to your website. And you're like, okay, sure. You know, I'm, I'm happy to, but I don't want to be actively going out there and getting it. I mean, we give instructions on how to install and, you know, in the product. So, you know, it's got our website on it. Yeah, they find us. They come to us after, you know, but... You know, not necessarily the repeat business is usually from designers and contractors that are doing Starbucks and universities and they keep coming back. The average person is going to order from one time kind of thing. Okay. Do you find yourself having to take a lot of customer service calls or tech support calls for that? No, no, it's pretty good. The good thing is we, we sell a very good quality product so we don't get many returns or issues. And most of it's usually just questions. Or people that are indecisive, like, oh, I'm not really sure what color. And, you know, what do you think I should do? And sometimes they just want to bounce an idea off you. Like, here's the size of my room. What size do you think I should use and what color? And, you know, they just, just want to, somebody that they can chat with. Like, and, you know, I make some jokes about, you know, oh, what does your wife want? What does your husband want? You know, happy wife, happy life. You know, they just, it, it's usually pretty light. It's pretty good. Okay. So you check it. What's, if you don't mind my asking, what is the name of your brand? East Coast Rustic. East Coast Rustic. Okay, I'll have yeah. to look that up. Yeah. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see people making when they're selling on Amazon or when they're selling on online in general? So I'm an accountant for a lot of Canadian Amazon sellers, and I see a new people coming in. And there's a big trend, and it's all over YouTube and you know Instagram, whatever. Like It's called private label, where... As I said with the yoga mat, hey, look, this yoga mat costs $3 on Alibaba. You can sell it for $30 on Amazon. Like, look at all the money. Make your own brand. And they have this aspiration that, okay, I'm going to do that, put my own name on it, and I'm going to eventually sell it for millions of dollars. But when you're first starting out, like, you don't understand the Amazon game. Maybe you've never really run a business before, and it's not that easy. If it was that easy, everybody would do it. You know, like, hey. I sell a high-end course, but other people sell courses, and I've seen these guys make more money selling courses than actually doing it. Um, you know, I'm different. I make a lot of money doing it, and I also make money teaching people how to do it. So the biggest mistake I see is people are like, great, I'm going to start. I'm going to do my own brand. I'm using this software that tells me how often something sells, and I'm going to decide on the product based on that. And that software is used by a 1,000 other people, and then I'm going to go to China, and we get it made, and the same manufacturer that I get it made from is also going to sell the same thing under his brand. So then, you know, by the time it actually arrives six months later, there's a ton of other people already selling it. And the decision you made when it was, you know, selling at $50, now the price is way down to 30 or 20 plus your ad spend. And suddenly you can't make any money at it. And you've got five or 10 grand invested into one product that now you can't sell. Whereas what I like is the arbitrage, like, particularly online arbitrage, because I just go to websites, and that's what I do. But mm -hmm. if you're going to retail arbitrage or online arbitrage or thrifting, you know, you're taking small calculated risks. Like you're not sinking five grand or 10 grand into one SKU that's unproven. You're buying this one Lego set that I, using the data, I know sells for this price usually, and it'll sell 20 units a day. So therefore, if I buy three at half price on clearance, I'm going to make money. 
and I'm going to make a few dollars and I will turn that over and probably by the time I buy it, ship it in, sell it and get paid, maybe it's three weeks later. Right. I'm not mm -hmm. getting samples and doing research and getting, you know, from Chinese manufacturer and, you know, waiting three weeks to get a sample and realizing that's crap and going to find another one. And, you know, like just take small risks, make profit, get comfortable. You know, maybe you do sell in home goods and, and you like that category, but then some other categories start to open. Now you're like, OK, let me look at toys for a bit. Now let me get into shoes for a bit. You know, and you're only taking just buy two items. Okay, I, I buy that. I saw a pair of shoes, or you know, I saw this toy. I think it, it'll make me money. I'll buy two of them. If you're dead wrong, you're gonna lose, you know, like twenty bucks, thirty bucks, right? If you're dead wrong on a private label product, you're gonna lose the ten grand you put in plus the ad spend that you you've spent trying to figure out that you were dead wrong. You know, take small risks, go broad first, figure out what works. Actually, sit back and say, okay, after I bought it and I finally sold it. When I bought it, did I think it was going to sell for $100 and I'd make X number of dollars? What did I actually sell it for at the end? And did that make sense? Sometimes, like, I do it too. I buy things that I don't really look and they're huge. And I'm like, well, that was too big. The amount of time it takes to prep these big items and send them in and the amount of profit, it wasn't worth the effort. The post analysis to say, was that a good decision or was that a bad decision? And being able to face the truth and say, it was a bad decision. Don't do that again. Or it was good amazing let's go do more of this find more of those right people don't do the post analysis so you know that's what i see is big risks just take small little risks get your confidence start building up that cash flow take that small investment roll the profits over and then you can start buying more inventory right okay You're talking a little bit about your course how in depth is it and is it interactive as far as are are you kind of leading people through or is it more of an evergreen type where it's already generated? I'm going to call it a hybrid. So I've got, okay. so wait, it's funny when COVID hit basically for the last like year and a half, two years, I started making training videos mm -hmm. and I think I've got probably like 12 hours now, 12 or 13 hours and I keep adding to it. But I started making all these training videos. Whenever somebody asked me a question, I was doing it. I'm like, let me record it and I'll talk just like this. You know, I got my talking head on there, you know, just me in the bottom corner and I'm walking you through what I'm doing and how to set things up or how I'm sourcing. I'm like, look, I'm going to Walmart right now. This is how I look. This is where I find things. So I've got videos that are very, here's what to do. And then I get videos where you're standing over my shoulder and I'm showing you how to do it. But still okay. those are, okay, those are canned. That already happened in the past. I've showed you what, you know, here's the strategies to go find new stuff. Now I have lists of stores. I have all kinds of that, but then, I also have a Facebook group just for the students where I'm in there and I'm basically spoon feeding you stuff to buy because, you know, like in a private label course, you know, people are like, Hey, go research this. And then it's going to take you six months before you even launch a product. Whereas if I'm doing online arbitrage, which is what my course is, I'm like, no, no, go buy this right now. You will make money right now. I want people to use it. I don't want you to just buy it and not use it because I know how powerful it can be. I mean, I've seen, you know, some of my best accounting clients, I've seen them grow over the years using this model and they start out, you know, with making twenty, thirty thousand dollars in sales and now they're in millions, you know, two or three years later. They've scaled up. I know what it can do. And it's not that hard. So if I can spoon feed you, like literally go buy this, you get that win, you feel the success, you're like, okay, why did that one work? Why was it a buy? How did he find it? Let me go do more of it, right? So if I can stack the deck, as you'd say, like in your favor as much as possible by telling you, hey, this is a great lead, go get it. And, you know, I get some people that DM me and they're like, Rob, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? You know, I'm going to buy 10. Does that make sense? And I'm like, yeah, I would definitely buy 10 or I'd buy 20 or no, I don't like it because of this. You know, like, so I, I do have that interaction. Um, it's not one-on-one -on -one coaching, but some of it is because I just want you to win. I want people to make money, right? Profit. Okay. And you teach people how to uh, do it remotely as well? So part of my, my training is, you know, from the very basic, setting up your account, how to do that, getting your tax settings right, to, okay, here's, you know, some of the plugins, the tools I use, here's the methods of sourcing. But here's also the evolution to, first, I always say, do it yourself. When you first start out, you have more time than you have money. And if you don't do it yourself, how do you know how to measure someone else to? 
How are they doing a good job? Or what's your definition of success? How many units are they getting through? That kind of thing. So at first I'm like, do it yourself. Here's the labels. Here's how it works. Understand that. Then as you start to outgrow that, then, okay, now go to the prep center. And here's what to look for in a prep center. Here's some of the prep centers I use. Here's, you know, the, the pros and cons of them. Or going to, hey, getting friends and family. You know, that's kind of an evolution that a lot of people will do. They'll do it themselves. Then they'll get the family involved. Sometimes, like, it's, a, it's you know, the husband and wife or partners or whatever. Then maybe they get the kids. The kids help them to do some prep as the business starts to grow and they pay the kids a few dollars. Then they get an aunt or an uncle and family friend because it's one of those things where, look, I just got a bunch of toys. I need you to slap labels on it and put it in a box. You can do it at any time of the day you want. I don't care. So for, you know, friends and family, it's like, okay, I can make a few extra dollars. You know, you pay me a dollar a unit to prep. Okay, cool. And that's how they start to grow their business and evolve. And then they're eventually, okay, now maybe we go to the prep center. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Is there anything that I, I have not asked you that you'd like to cover or expound on? We lived in Toronto and we were saying that we were moving. You just hear so many people saying, I wish I could do that, but I can't. I wish I could do that, but I can't. Well, well why? You know, and everybody has their reasons. Everybody has their objections. You know, like, do I have my reasons why I couldn't move? For sure. But, you know, it's also, why not? You know, if it's, if it's what you want to do, you just got to kind of figure out how it works. I mean, some people just cut on a whim and say, hey, I'm leaving, sell everything and move. I mean, we've, we've been planning it very slowly. I mean, it's different if it was just me and you're like, okay, see you later, nine to five job. I can go wherever. But mm-hmm. once you've got kids in the mix, you need to be. You need to be sure. And sometimes I see people coming down here and they're not sure. They don't have their money right. They think that they'll figure it out when they get down here. And those are the people that leave sooner than they wanted, you know. But that's why I love selling on Amazon. I mean, it's opened up a a world to us, you know, the flexibility. And, you know, like, I don't care what age you are, whether you're 18 or whether you're 68. Like, it's it's something that you can do if you have a little bit of computer skills it's doable. It's achievable. And it doesn't matter where you live in the world, you know, as long as you've got computer access and, you know, your bank account credit card, you can do it. Okay. Let's talk about a little bit about your podcast. Uh, Sure. It's, uh, it's called selling from the beach. That's our brand and that's our website. We obviously we have our accounting firm, but you know, we decided that we wanted to go do more teaching and do more courses and things than, you know, we rebranded. So we're selling stuff from the beach. So, um, my wife has a course on how to create your own children's books, even if you can, can't can draw or anything. So she did that. At the same time, I did my online masterclass. Um, so that's why we kind of roped it all around that. But at the same time, it was during COVID, and I started listening to a ton more podcasts. And I was like, maybe I should make a podcast. I don't know. It sounds like fun. I mean, hey, why did you make one? It sounds like fun, right, Greg? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I get to I talk to all thing. kinds of interesting people. Yeah, so I do the same uh, interview style kind of as you, but I do it to, you know, basically almost everybody I've had on the show has been a friend of mine just, you know, talking about their stories and, you know, how they got selling and whether they're selling on Amazon or the Shopify or, you know, whatever. And it's it's fun. It's inspiring. And, you know, it's and that, that's how I do it. But it's only stuff that interests me. So lately I've been you know, like I really wanted to talk to somebody who sold Lego full time. So I found a guy in one of my Facebook groups that sells Lego full time. So I had him on, you know, like it, it's, as you said, talking to people that interest you, right? Yeah. I'll definitely have to check it out. What's the, what's a good profit margin when all is said and done? Obviously, you know, as high as you can get it, but sure. what is a realistic profit margin? So I look at, when I'm looking at an item, like let's exclude all the other costs and everything. But let's just say if I'm looking at an item to sell, I don't care how fast it sells. I want to make a minimum of $5, whether it's a $5 item and I can sell it for 20 and I profit five, whatever. I want to make $5 a unit. Anything less than that, it's always worth my time, damages this, that I, I just don't. So the more I like to sell higher dollar items because Amazon's fees are, there's two fees. So one is a percentage of your selling price. And the other is a fixed fee based on the size of the item for them to basically pick and pack it. So if it's going to cost me five bucks for them to pick and pack it, if it's a $20 item, that's a higher percentage than if it was a hundred dollar item. So if I can sell more hundred dollar items, then my overall fees as a percentage will be smaller than if I sell the cheaper ones. Right? So I'd rather sell more expensive stuff, but I want, 
minimum five bucks. Don't care how fast it goes. And I, my minimum is like 30% ROI return on the investment. So if I'm, you know, if I'm going to buy something for a hundred bucks, I want to make at least 30%, 30 bucks on that. Okay. The longer it's going to sit, the more ROI or profit I want to make out of it. So, you know, if I'm buying a shoe, it's not going to move as fast as the hot selling toy. So I need to make a higher ROI and profit to do it. If you look at a business overall, you know, as you first start out, if you're selling less, you can cherry pick more. So your ROI and your margin should be better. You're not paying a prep center because they're going to cost, you know, $1.50, $1.60 a unit to prep. Um, you know, you're going to have additional software fees. Uh, that'll start to go. But when you first, you know, start, it's going to be higher. As you start to go and grow up, you know, I'd say you'd want a 20% margin after all your expenses. If you didn't have a 20% profit margin, you know, so you're selling, let's say you're selling a million dollars, you know, you should have a $200,000 profit. Okay. That's what I, that's what I would be aiming for. Now, some people go a little bit lower because maybe they're doing more wholesale. Some people should be able to get it higher if you're cherry picking more, you know, retail online arbitrage. Um, depends if you're using the prep center, if you have, you know, it's, it's anybody on salary. Um, if you're doing all the work yourself, you know, that should obviously be higher because you're not paying yourself. That profit is, you know, what you're ultimately getting. Um, but that's, if I was lower than 20, I'd be disappointed. Even if it was, you know, fully outsourced, I would start to look. You know, I've seen some people where, they start growing and they're, they're worried about the top line sales, but then, you know, the bottom starts suffering because they get more overheads and they get a bigger warehouse and things like that. And suddenly you're like, great, you doubled your sales and your profits only went up, you know, 5%. Mm. Right? Yeah. What point do you think somebody should actually start using like a, a prep center? When you can't do it yourself. Okay. When you're confident in it and you know what you're doing. And then when you can't do it yourself. Okay. But I mean, I've seen people that jump straight to it. I've seen people that, you know what, I'll prep for a month, learn it, understand the labels, the SKUs, things like that, and then totally outsource it. No one's going to do it as good as you. No matter what it is in your business, anything in life, you're always going to do it better. You should. Most things. They're not going to care as much because you're just a client. But, you know, when you can't do it anymore or you don't want to do it, then you should get the prep center. And I'll tell you, when you first start out, you get excited, you're getting the hustle going, you're buying products, but they also take over your house. And that's fine for the first little bit, but then it wears on you, you know, and you're like, my house is never empty. There's always boxes showing up. There's always, you know, like, there's always chaos. You know, you want your house back. So then when you decide you want your house back, that's when you need to get a prep center. Yeah. I, even when I was selling the books, I remember they, you know, they would take over and it was also, I was doing a lot of the, the book fulfillment myself and, I had a pretty good system about where to put stuff, but it would, I would invariably sell something that I could never find and end up having to, you know, re refund. And I hated doing that. Then of oh, course yeah. you'd find it like a month later or something. Yeah. See, I don't, I don't do the merchant fulfilled. I do only Amazon FBA. I do it every once in a while, but for the most part, so we get the stuff in, ship it out. It's an Amazon but even still, like when I was first doing it, you know, we had a small spare bedroom in Toronto. That's what I used. Then it became the garage. And then after I grew the garage, you know, it's when we moved here and it was totally out of the house. Okay. Is there any way at all when you're, you know, buying stuff on Amazon and reselling it on Amazon, is there any way to have them <laughs> be the, like the middleman and drop ship for you? No, it's uh yeah, no, no, you can't. I wish, you know, literally I'm like, hey, Amazon, just take your label off and put mine on it. But no, unfortunately, you've got it. So those are called Amazon flips where you buy it from Amazon, you get it and then send it right back in. And, you know, sometimes Amazon doesn't do the right prep that they're supposed to. You know, they want you to polybag it or bubble wrap it and they don't do it. So, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Um, but a lot of people don't even know that you can do that. And, you know, they can't even wrap their head around Amazon flips. But Amazon's a retailer like everybody else. You know, they need to clear out inventory. They need to get rid of boots during the summer. You know, they need to get rid of sandals during the winter. Um, other competitors go on sale for this Nintendo game and they drop their price too. So, you know, there's, and there's also Amazon exclusives where Amazon gets a specific SKU, like a Funko Pop or a Star Wars figure, and it's only available on Amazon. Well, guess what? You can buy that. And when Amazon runs out of them, you can sell it back at a higher price. 
So let's go ahead and get ready to wrap this up. I'll let you get back to your day and to your family and to Costa Rica. I was earlier, we were admiring the view. Looks like you've got a great place. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not bad. We live in uh, this, this, it's called the Reserva Conchal, and it's this big reserve. It's a massive development. There's two hotels in the grounds. There's a massive 18 hole PGA caliber golf course that pretty much nobody plays on except for us. And then there's a bunch of condo developments and some houses. We've got a beach club, we've got a beautiful pool. Um, the beach is down there. Like it's all. It's nice and it's safe for my kids and, you know, they can just play outside and, um, yeah, and it's, you know, hot and sunny. Lately, lately, there's been on some storms over on the Atlantic and we were getting some of that. So there's been a lot of rain, so it's not all sunshine, but, uh, and we're going into our rainy season now, so we will get more rain, but. Yeah. What's the number one piece of advice that you can give for our listeners? If you want, like, I, I, I don't care if you want to move to Costa Rica, if you want to start, you know, you want to travel in an RV, whatever. We always say, if you want to design a lifestyle that you want, figure out what that side hustle is and let it grow. You know, like, I love Amazon because it's a very low barrier to entry. You don't have to deal with the customers. You don't have to create your own website, all this stuff. Like, it's something that you could start so easily with a few dollars just at night, you know, and it can grow into a full-time business where you could, you want to travel an RV, travel an RV, you know, like I, I know people that they tour the country just in an RV all summer and they work for, you know, kind of Q4, sell it on Amazon. Like there's just so much freedom, but start that plan, start that side hustle while you have that job, because then you can build that nest egg of profit and keep turning it over to build up that inventory. So you get to that amount where the profits that are kicking out could replace that job. You know, like some people think, oh, I'll quit my job right away. No, no, no. Keep working that job because that's what you live on. Build up that side hustle and that nest egg of inventory till eventually it can replace the job. Good advice. Now, what, what's the best way for people to check you out and get in touch with you? Probably our main site, sellingfromthebeach.com. That's our website. And from there, I've got links to the podcast, our Facebook group. Facebook group's good. I think I got like 1,300 people in there. We just mostly talk about selling on Amazon and some other things. Um, that's the main hub. And, you know, I've got my free – I have a free course there, um, which if you just want to get in, start exploring, you know, that address is oamasterclass.com slash free FBA. And there you'll see a bunch of my videos. Once you get into the course, it's totally free but it'll get you to set up your account and give you a little bit of taste of, you know, what's going. I mean, the biggest barrier is pulling out your credit card and, you know, spending $39.99 a month on an Amazon account to get going. But if you can do that, guess what? Maybe you'll sell some stuff, right? So. All right. That's a wrap. Thank you, Rob, for being a guest on Entrepreneurs Over 40. Thanks, Craig. Man. It's been a lot of fun, buddy. Uh, same here. I really enjoyed talking to Rob and learning not only about online arbitrage, but his decision to become an expat in Costa Rica. Now, Rob got started early on in e-commerce when he created his own website selling craft products for toll painting that his dad made. He learned how to code the site by copying Amazon and other online retailers, but quickly learned that build it and they will come was not a viable strategy. He learned that by going to online forums about toll painting, he could participate and direct others to his site. By doing so, he found that his customers were often teachers who would buy from him in bulk. He spent some time in the Cayman Islands and really enjoyed it, but ultimately found himself back in Toronto where he bounced around in various accounting roles. He and his wife, Marcia, identified that this was not the lifestyle they wanted and began making a plan to opt out and do their own thing. She wrote a children's book that she sold on Amazon, and they both started their own accounting firm. Rob also started selling on Amazon, first doing thrifting and then doing private label, but ultimately decided that private label was not for him. Rob discovered that succeeding in private label was very difficult. Typically, you hear about people that source a, project, a product from China via Alibaba. It takes a long time to get the product in, 
And by that time that you get it, you're competing with a bunch of other sellers as well as the manufacturer. To have any success at all in private label requires a huge ad spend and was something that Rob decided was not for him. While their plan was to wait until 2022 to make the move to Costa Rica, it was accelerated when Marsha lost her job. They were able to sell their condo quickly in a seller's market and then sold or got rid of whatever possessions they didn't want to bring with them. They ultimately ended up moving in a resort area with amenities that were at least as good if not superior to what they had before. Rob describes the Pura Vida lifestyle as a very relaxed lifestyle where Pura Vida is almost used as a form of greeting. The downside is it can be used as an excuse for missed expectations as well. Sorry we closed the office down yesterday. Eh, Pura Vida. Rob talked about online arbitrage, which as he defined is basically buying something from another online website and reselling it on Amazon. He will have the product shipped directly to a prep center that he does business with and they will inspect it Make sure that it isn't damaged and then send it on on to Amazon for him. Because it is fulfilled by Amazon, Rob's products qualify for prime status, which is a huge advantage for him. Rob also really likes online arbitrage because it isn't as risky as private label, and you can get a series of wins with very little risk. As he said, just take small little risks, get your confidence, start building up that cash flow, take that small investment, Roll the profits over, and then you can start buying more inventory. Rob uses several tools. Keepa, which is a Chrome extension, shows him the historical sales data over time and will allow him to set an alert to buy an item when it is at a low sales price. He also uses a tool called AZ Insight, which is, allows him to c- calculate the potential profit on any item he is currently viewing. Rob is also a huge fan of using credit card rewards and stacking those with online stores that are having discount sales. He also recommends starting in home goods and then going to toys when you can qualify to be ungated for that category. In addition to Amazon, Rob still sells home goods products on the East Coast Rustic e-commerce site with his dad. They started out on Etsy and have expanded to house as well as Home Depot. Rob's dad handles the manufacturing and he handles the e-commerce, tech support, and customer service sides of the house. Rob's number one piece of advice, I don't care if you want to move to Costa Rica, if you want to travel in an RV, whatever. We always say that you want to design a lifestyle that you want, figure out what that side hustle is and let it grow. Now he likes Amazon because it's a very low barrier to entry. You don't have to deal with customers. You don't have to create a website, all that stuff. It's just something that you can start so easily with a few dollars just at night and grow it into a full-time business where you could work wherever. Start that plan, start that side hustle while you still have that job, because then you can build that nest egg of profit and keep turning it over to build up that inventory so that you get to that amount with the profits that you are kicking out and you could replace that job. He said, some people think, oh, I'll quit my job right away. No, 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 no. Keep working that job because that's what you live on. Build up that side hustle and that nest egg of inventory until eventually it can replace the job. Now, Rob has his own course where he teaches others the ins and outs of selling on Amazon via online arbitrage. His main website is sellingfromthebeach.com, and he has a podcast by the same name chronicling other Amazon sellers' journeys. Rob was also kind enough to include a link to some free training that he has at oamasterclass.com slash free FBA and oamasterclass.com slash webinar. Now next week we'll have on Joe Polizzi talking about his book Content Inc. and how you can start a content first business, build a massive audience and become radically successful with little to no money. Be sure to hit subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss it or any other episodes. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40. Check us out at entrepreneursover40.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast directory.